Well, hey everyone, good morning and welcome to Resurrection City Church. Like Zach said, it's in the name. Um, we, uh, one time a year we get to say we are uh, named after Easter and it's really exciting to me. Um, it's a very intentional choice for us. Uh, Resurrection, Easter, is a, it's a sacred holiday for Christians and today is a sacred day. It's a sacred weekend and I think it's good for us to just pause and remember that right now. Uh, Lots of other stuff is going on and and can distract us, but I really do believe in this moment that we're on holy ground as we celebrate this sacred weekend. Um, As a a pastor that I really look up to, a guy named Tim Keller said, soon before he died of cancer, if Jesus Christ was actually raised from the dead, then everything is going to be all right. Whatever you're worried about, whatever you're afraid of, everything will actually be okay. And I think it's good for us to be reminded of that this morning. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get into our message. Risen Jesus, we ask you to to join us this morning. Um, We are reminded today that you are not a dead God. You are not a God of of history. You're not some some figure who we we can look back on and maybe just gain some wisdom from, but you're risen, you're alive, and you you are with us. And today is the day that we most uh, strongly remember that truth, that you are you, you join us here. You're with us when we gather together in your name. And Lord, we ask that you would please do that in this morning uh, through your spirit as we uh, meditate on what it means that you are alive, God, and what it means for us specifically that you've been raised from the dead. Lord, just pray that you'd be with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, my name is Joel. I don't think I said that when I first got up here. I'm one of the pastors here at Res City. Uh, we're just really glad to have you joining us this morning. Um, whether you're maybe you're visiting, you're with, with some friends and family joining for Easter, uh, maybe you're you're checking Res City out. Whatever it is, we're just happy to have you with us on this sacred morning. Um, now it is Easter Sunday, and 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 we are celebrating that as a church. But we also, as a, as a church, find ourselves in the middle of, of a series of, of messages and conversations that we're we're having around the idea of the ordinary. Uh, we're calling that series "Ordinary Faith," and it's really based on this idea that we all live ordinary lives. Um, trying to be extraordinary all the time is actually a crushing weight, and despite the the constant unrelenting pressure to be extraordinary that our society can place on us at times, the ordinary existence that we all live is actually good. God finds it to be good, and he often speaks to us in the midst of what seems to be very ordinary things. And in the midst of our very uh, ordinary and cluttered and sometimes very chaotic lives, we can have a faith that is actually robust and pleasing to God in the midst of it, uh, even extraordinary. And that's what the series that we've been going through and reflecting on is all about. Now, when we talk about what's ordinary, I think a lot of times we think about like getting a C on a test or, uh, you know, washing dishes or brushing our teeth or topping out at middle management, right, but never maybe getting above that at any point in your life. But you know what else is incredibly ordinary is death. <laughs> death is actually maybe the most ordinary thing that there is in human existence because everybody does it. Uh, every single day, people die all the time. 167,000 people die every day in the world. Uh, No matter how well you take care of yourself, no matter how good you eat or work out, no matter all all these different things, you will die someday, right? And when you die, it's normal to stay dead. This is ordinary human existence, all right? That's been true of every human in history except for Jesus. So if dying is the most ordinary thing you could imagine, then being raised from the dead would be, by definition, extraordinary. And so on this Easter Sunday, we are celebrating that the ordinary that we all live in was completely interrupted by something that was extraordinary. And so for us, as we're in this series, but we're also spending time uh, celebrating Easter this morning, I want to talk about the mixture of the sacred and extraordinary with our own ordinary. And we're going to explore a passage from 2 Corinthians that talks sort of about how these two things mix. We kind of, as Christians, live with this weird paradox or tension of, of the extraordinariness of Jesus and his resurrection in our ordinary lives. And I think this passage is one of the best in all scripture to talk about what it means to bring those two together, specifically when we bring in the idea of resurrection into it. All right, so let's hop into it. Um, like I said, it's, it's uh, the, the, the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to read verses 6 to 18 as the, uh, the verses we're going to be meditating on this morning. So let me read those for us. 
For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist said uh, when he wrote, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we now will soon for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So I want to talk today about what it is that makes Easter extraordinary in the midst of our ordinary lives. And I, you know, I could pick many different things to explain what it is that makes Easter extraordinary. Today I want to focus on three things that we can kind of uh, find as we meditate on this passage, all right? And the first is that it explains our current state. The second is that it resets our desires. And the third is that it gives us resilience. So that will be kind of the, the structure of the sermon today is working through these three points based off the passage. All right, so first of all, let's get into that first one. Paul is using an image to describe what it's like to be an ordinary person with ordinary experiences while also being a follower of the risen Jesus, and that is a treasure in the fragile pot pottery of human lives. This is, ex this is what our current state is, that Paul says. In verse 7, he writes, we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. I love this phrase, uh, fragile pottery of human lives. It comes from a New Testament scholar named Michael Gorman, because I think it's so perfect to describe ordinary existence. It's a sort of paradox or tension, right? We are ordinary, but when we are disciples of Jesus, we house something extraordinary within us. The extraordinariness of Easter comes to live in us, and, and we're going to talk about what that is in a little bit, but first I want to focus on the clay jar part. Now, the clay jars that Paul is referring to here are like, kind of like the disposable packaging of the ancient world, right? So if you picture like Ziploc bags or maybe cardboard boxes that you ship things in, this is maybe a decent parallel to what these clay jars would have been like in the ancient world. It's not the kind of thing you put treasure into, right? It, it would be a place that you would expect the treasure to get broken, right? Or, or someone could steal it pretty easily out of something like this. And to Paul, being fragile uh, pottery means being ordinary and struggling a lot of times with the pressure of everyday life. And he describes what that looks like. He says, being pressed on every side by trouble. For me, when I think about what that means, I think, you know, my days and weeks being just stuffed to the gills with problems to solve. Some of them minor, some of them major, but the constant pressure on them really starts to wear on you after a while. He talks about being perplexed. Right? Perhaps that means feeling like you're just making life up as you go. Right? You feel like you're supposed to have it all figured out, but you, to be honest, you're not, you don't. You're just going day by day and kind of hoping it all works out. That's really what your life often looks like. He talks about being knocked down, working your hardest, right? but things don't work out like you hope. And you have to adjust. You have to recalibrate and hope that maybe if you try again, it'll work this time. Right? Or maybe even being physically beat down. Right? Maybe you have annoying medical conditions that derail the life that you'd prefer to have, that you always thought you would have. It's ordinary to feel this way. And Paul thinks of himself when he uses this image, I think. Right? And this is actually why I love the letter of 2 Corinthians so much. I find myself coming back to it frequently. Because as you read through it, you know, this is one passage in it, but throughout it you find Paul sort of at his most vulnerable and ordinary, which I, I resonate with personally far more than with the sort of legendary version of Paul that we often you know, think of him as. 
Uh, he's writing this letter to the Corinthians, and it's this congregation that he has kind of had a dialogue with back and forth. The, 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 the letter of 1 Corinthians in our Bibles is, is, comes before and kind of details some of his issues with this church, and it's clear that he has to sort of kickstart his relationship with them. He has to defend himself to them. They've been questioning him and his leadership uh, as the relationship with him has started to go south for a bunch of different reasons. And so a lot of this letter is actually him not writing, it's writing as a defense of himself. It's not necessarily writing about the experience of all Christians all the time, although I think it very much applies to us, but it's kind of defending himself against these apparently extraordinary rival apostles who've showed up at the church in Corinth. They portray themselves to the people of Corinth as much uh, smarter, as much better, as more accomplished, more learned, much more flashy than him. And so they're trying to get the Corinthians to let them kind of come and lead their, their congregation and kind of uh, abandon Paul as their primary leader and founder because they're so much more extraordinary than he is. And if you don't know much about Paul, he's often thought of as this very pioneering, trailblazing entrepreneur, right? This is one of many churches that he started. Uh, he kind of went all around the Mediterranean, planting little churches, and he seems like this really like extraordinary entrepreneur, like that's how we would think of him probably in the present. Someone who is very like extraordinary that we would look up to and want to be like. But it's clear that the people who knew him thought he was kind of plain and dull. Like that's, the, the, that's what comes across in these letters as you read them. And depending on when you guess at this letter being written, it's, it's possible he'd been coming out of a period of real burnout and suffering from it. Um, he's made some miscalculations or maybe even mistakes in how he's handled his relationship with his congregation. And he lets us know that he was dealing all, with all of this in a very ordinary way. Right? Early in the letter, he mentions how he had gone through what we might call like a nervous breakdown of some kind, where he is, it's a depression, where he is saying, I'm ready to give up on life. Like, he says that this is where I was, and it's clear he has a lot of anxiety about the situation with the Corinthian church. I don't know if you know what it's like when you, you know, you, you have someone you've been close to, and something happens with the relationship, so maybe something bad happens between you both, and you don't talk for a while. You don't get to communicate with them for a long time, and you just lie awake, lie awake at night wondering, like, what, they are, what are they thinking? Like, it must be bad. Like, they must hate me. I haven't heard from them in a while. There's no way in which this uh, situation is getting better by our, uh, our gap in, in communication. There's a quote I once heard, actually from the Vikings special teams coordinator, a guy named Matt Daniels, where he says, uh, whenever there is a gap in communication, negativity fills the void. And this is so often how uh, relationships with people go. And I think this is where Paul was likely at at this point, imagining the worst about how things were going in Corinth. And you can really, it comes across as you read this letter. And so all of this reveals a guy who is very much like everyone else sitting in this room right now, very human, very ordinary, very aware of his ordinariness and his limitation, and really unsure of what's going to happen next. Fragile pottery, maybe even chipped and cracked pottery would be a great way to describe someone like that. Now, that life doesn't seem like the kind of thing that the God of the universe would des decide to put his greatest treasure inside of, right? It's not where I would put it. And I doubt any of you would choose to put your, tre your greatest treasure inside of some kind of container like that, right? It's actually kind of absurd to think that that's where God has chosen to put his treasure, right? It seems like a good place to put it if you would like to get it broken or stolen. And that's actually the heart of the good news of the gospel. God doesn't play the game like he's supposed to by saving his best for what seems best to everybody else. Right? He gives his best to those who seem the most unworthy, and that's exactly what we see here. He makes it new, he sets it apart with love and with purpose, and he makes it more than ordinary by doing that. And so this is the current state all Christians live in. Ordinary, feeling even worse than that sometimes, but still filled with God's treasure through grace nonetheless. Now Paul says that the treasure is the light of God's glory, and light often, reveal, often means like truth revealed to us, Right? And I think the truth that he's referring to is found in verse 14. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. So what Paul is saying is that what's true of Jesus on Easter morning, that he had died, he had come back to life again, and was living in this new sort of life, this resurrection life, will be also true of those who worship him. This extraordinary event of Easter 
means that those who worship Jesus will also become more than, more than ordinary, extraordinary themselves at some point too. I think the question we always ask is, what is this supposed to look like? What would it mean for us to also be raised like Jesus? What would that look like? And how does that connect to our ordinary lives? Well, I think one of the interesting things that we find when we look at Jesus' own resurrection is kind of what, uh, how he's strangely different than he was before, right? It's really interesting. So let's look at this example from the Easter account given in the book of John. It comes from chapter 20, verses 24 to 27. Or, sorry, verses 24 to 29 is what we'll end up reading. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. But they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. I put my fingers into them, and I place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So there's this, this dramatic moment. There's this, one of the disciples, a guy named Thomas, is very skeptical of what he's heard. He's not yet seen Jesus with his own eyes raised from the dead. And he is brought into a face-to-face -face encounter with him. He sees him. He knows him. He comes to find within himself this deep awareness that Jesus has not just been raised because people are talking about it, but he's actually met him. He believes that he's alive again. And we see what, it, what has happened to Jesus in his resurrection. Right? He still has the scars from his crucifixion in his hand which is kind of crazy, right? He still has the, the, the side of his body was pierced by a spear when he was hanging on the cross, and that's still there, which seems very weird for someone who's come back to life again, right? Uh, they, they are not in danger of killing him. They're there, they're to be seen, but he is not afraid of them killing him or destroying him now. Actually, their presence on his body now point to the extraordinariness of the existence that he now lives, of what has happened to him in his resurrection, He's gone through deep wounding and death, but he's come out the other side living with a vitality of life that is beyond what he lived beforehand because now the kinds of things that would have killed him before can't kill him anymore. And he knows that because he can, he can see the scars of those on himself. They're no threat to him. And what Thomas sees about this resurrection is beautiful to him. Right? It's so beautiful that he believes him to be, G, be, believes him to be Lord and God. Now, what is it that makes him beautiful here? Certainly, it's, it, what makes him beautiful is that uh, he is unique to Jesus, like as God himself, right? But I think there's something else that's beautiful about him that will be true of us when we are raised as well. Um, psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she's actually the person who came up with the, the five stages of grief, so maybe you've heard her name before from that. She has this quote where she talks about how beautiful people happen that I heard once that I thought was very, I think, helpful for understanding what's going on in the resurrection. She says, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, who have known suffering, have known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep, loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. Her point is that beautiful people come through some setback or pain, and it creates some sort of beauty that's unparalleled in them before as they navigate through their traumas and their hardships, the things that could have killed them but, in fact, have not, and have made them stronger, have made them a different person than they were because they've come out the other end. And I think that same principle is working here with Jesus. Resurrection is referring to this making beautiful of people on a larger scale than that. And it doesn't refer to us finding our own way out of it. It refers to God drawing us through our suffering, through our defeat, through our loss, through our struggle, and into the other side by his resurrection power. It's another word for God taking what is fragile and broken and fusing it together with a new kind of life that jolts it into a new kind of existence, making it beautiful. Now, I don't know if, this, if you've ever heard of the Japanese art form kintsugi, but I think that's a great example of what resurrection life will look like. Here's an example of a kintsugi pot. 
Um, it's the art of repairing broken pottery by, w w with lacquer or dusted and mixed um, powder, gold, silver, or platinum. And it's renowned for, its, for the significance that it, it gets across, but also its beauty, right? Because you are taking this broken pottery, these clay jars, right? You can see what I'm doing here, I imagine. And you're fusing them back together with the most rare and valuable substance, gold and silver. That's what now holds these together. And you can see that throughout the pot. It makes it stronger than before, and it makes it more beautiful than before. And it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object, rather as something that you try to disguise. Right? It makes it into something revered and beautiful, more precious than it was before, that is fused with precious metals, precious metals that hold it together now. And I think that's a picture of what resurrection looks like. It takes the fragile pottery of human lives, and it doesn't discard the pottery because it's ordinary, it's chipped, it's cracked, it's no good anymore, but it transforms it into something even more beautiful than it was before as it comes through death, through the, the pressures that we face in our normal lives today and comes out the other side, and now nothing can hurt it. And we, we see this in small ways in our day-to-day -day lives now, but it's nothing compared to what God is going to do for us in the ultimate resurrection. And that's what makes it extraordinary. And so this mixture of extraordinary and ordinary is who we are now as Christians. It's how we identify as people who are uh, finding this to be true of us in the, in the present and know what will happen to us one day in the future. That's the treasure we hold within us. Now, as Paul says, this glory uh, will outweigh any trouble that we have now, right? Now, you'd think as Christians, people who are aware of this kind of paradox that we have within us, that we would have this, this treasure would be enough to get us through life, right? We, we would think that this, is the, that this is the thing we should focus all of our attention on and put all of our hope in. And to be honest, we're not always great at that, right? We find hope and we look for hope and satisfaction in other things all the time, things that are not necessarily part of the treasure that God has given us. Now, the words of the angels that are spoken to the women visiting the tomb, I think, are kind of helpful picture as to what it is for us to go through life looking for uh, satisfaction and hope in things that do not have it. They say to the, the women as they show up, why are you looking for the living among the dead? I think that is something we do so often. We get so focused on the things that will die that are actually quite dull and ordinary. Things like power and fame, money, sex, accolades, whatever it is that have failed to satisfy us and have been failing to satisfy humans honestly for centuries, and we still think that they're going to give us hope, that they will vault us into a future that we can be proud of, that we think they're actually extraordinary. But in reality, they fall so short of what is extraordinary about Easter and what is promised to us as Easter people. And so Easter gives us a chance to be reminded of what is truly extraordinary and to reset our desires, okay? And I'm talking a little bit about heaven here. Easter resets our desires. That's the second thing about it that is extraordinary. Now, I, I don't know if you found this to be true, but you sometimes hear, I've heard people talk about heaven as something that sounds like really uninteresting to them or very dull, right? And heaven is what Christians have typically called resurrection life, this life we will live as resurrected people one day right? It seems boring to them, right? They think of it as this, some kind of suburban hell, right? You see that in some renditions sometimes. Uh, it's essentially a church service in the sky that's filled with morally righteous living, which if you believe popular media usually looks like a life of looking down on other people, wearing sweater vests, repressing themselves, denying other people's pleasures, and saying fiddlesticks instead of the other F word, Okay? And you sometimes hear people say, hell, I've heard, actually heard people say this, seems way more fun because you can kind of do whatever you want, right? That's where all the fun people are going to go, they, the people who just live life doing whatever felt good to them. That's, that's, that's what hell would be like, and that seems way cooler to them than heaven. I actually remember classmates in high school would say that kind of stuff. They expected all the other cool people like them would be in hell someday. I actually remember someone saying that. They thought it would be a big party. It kind of shows the degree to which that we tend to have this warped view of what good and evil is, right? That evil is fun and exciting and innovative and interesting and goodness and righteousness and justice are predictable, they're lame, they're boring. I think the fact that these tend to be the two options that we have about what is going to happen to people when they die, either an extra boring church service in the sky or a super dope frat party, kind of tells us what kind of an imagination that we tend to have. 
right? We are looking for the living among the dead. It's like asking a kid who's only ever eaten Tootsie Rolls to describe what the best chocolate in the world would be like, okay? And no offense if you like Tootsie Rolls, but it's not even chocolate, <laughs> right? But this is kind of how we are when we talk about what we think heaven must look like, right? We have such a limited idea of how the goodness of God that is shown in resurrection is actually diverse. It's exciting. It's deeply satisfying. And it's because we don't really ever see it in life on earth right now, right? Because, yeah, a boring church in the, in the sky does sound super lame. But to be honest, like, living in a, a dope frat party forever also sounds super boring and lame too, right? No one actually wants to live like that kind of existence for their whole life when they die, right? Even the fun paradises that we draw up don't really, aren't places that satisfy our deepest urges, right? Ask the adult who can now eat all the chocolate that they, ever, that they never could eat as a kid, right? No one's going to ever stop them from sitting and eating chocolate all day if by the time they go to bed, they actually feel good, right? Ask the, the married person, right, if the deep longings for sex and emotional intimacy that they always expected marriage to give them before they got married, now that they're several years in, ask them if they're actually living in never-ending bliss, right? No married person would ever tell you that's what marriage is actually like, but that's what we assume it must be a lot of times before we actually end up there, right? We, we, we tend to tell ourselves that this reality will satisfy all my urges, but we never actually get those urges satisfied when we get there. Even the best that we can imagine, we find ourselves unsatisfied in it. And a lot of times, you find people who've reached some summit. They've gotten to this place that they wanted to get to, and they've learned contentedness in it. They are happy, right? But it's exactly that that they've learned. They've learned contentedness in it. Right? Contentedness is a noble, noble characteristic. Right? I think all Christians should learn contentedness. But let's recognize what it is. It, it, it's not being satisfied in our deepest desires and learning to have joy in the midst of that anyway. So the question is, what are the deeper desires and longings inside of us for? Right? If nothing on earth is going to satisfy those urges, are they there just to tease us? Are they there so they can be satisfied? And I think the answer is yes. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. The kinds of things that we know we long for, that we try to tell ourselves can be satisfied in the types of you know, small H heavens that we build up in our minds, if those things are within us, and if we, we, if we uh, um, sorry, I'm getting lost here, if we can't describe them or know what it would look like to get them, that's what resurrection or heaven must be. Right? If you can't quite describe it and you can't attain it on your own, but it's an urge and a longing deep within you, inside of you, that's what resurrection in heaven must be. Otherwise, why else would those be within us? Why else would there be nothing on earth that could fulfill that void in us? That's what we expect resurrection to be like. That's the place where our deepest longings are designed to be fulfilled in, and it resets our desires. Okay, so if that's in the future, what about now? How do we live in the present as we anticipate that future, right? And that's the, the, the next thing I want to talk about here as we close the sermon is how Easter gives us resilience. The troubles that we face in the present are pointing us to a glory that outweigh the trouble and put into perspective our present troubles. And I think it gives Christians, Easter people, a kind of resilience that you frankly see nowadays. Resilience in the midst of our ordinariness and insecurities, the current fragile pottery of our human lives. And that's what Paul talks about in verses 8 to 10. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Here's the truth. We will feel perplexed. We will feel pressed on all sides by troubles. We will get knocked down. Just having the treasure within us doesn't mean we're immune from those things now. Christians are going to feel all these things, and it will leave us broken. It might even kill us. But those things can never seal our fate. They can never own us. We can never be defeated by them. 
If we are going to be raised by Jesus, then whenever we find in ourselves metaphorical or literal uh, holes in our sides and our hands, wounds deep in our psyches, chronic pains in our bodies, we can know that these things might hurt us for a bit now, but they are not going to destroy us. They have no power or ability to do that. And when we realize that, we're talking about hope, which is one of the most powerful forces in the whole earth. And this hope has a revitalizing effect on us now, Paul says in verses 16 to 18. This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone but the things we cannot see will last forever. We can learn to pick ourselves back up and keep going. And as we do, we start to experience what it will be like to become the beautiful people that we talked about before in the present, as small resurrections happen to us all the time in anticipation of what God will do to us one day when we are raised like Jesus. So as we close today... I'm going to guess you probably are coming into this feeling in some ways, maybe maybe small, but maybe large, like you're a fragile piece of fragile pottery, right? You you know, you're feeling perplexed, you're feeling knocked down, you're feeling pressed on all sides in some way. I know that's true of all of us in this room. And our instinct at holidays, right, as we gather together with family and friends, a lot of times is to hide that stuff, right? It's to smile for the family, enjoy the day's festivities, People ask how you're doing, you just say good and you move on, right? To not think about what's troubling us and to definitely not let anyone else know that that's what's going on. I actually think Easter is a time to more deeply dwell on these things, not to less deeply dwell on them. Because when we do, we can start to push through. We start to remember the treasure within us that we have access to because of the risen Jesus. We start to realize we are like him, we are like Paul as people who experience brokenness, but come, we know we have the hope of coming out of it on the other side. And it's only in deeply meditating on that that we can actually understand the depth of the hope that we have because of Easter. And so as we enter a time of worship today, assess yourself. Ask yourself, where am I right now? Are you, are you feeling like Paul? Are you feeling like fragile pottery in some way? Remember how incredible it is that the God of life itself has said to you, oh, I'm working on making you beautiful right now in the midst of this. Search your deep longings. Realize that that if you're trying to find them to be satisfied in something else, know that those things are good and know that they will one day deeply be satisfied in resurrection life. And if you're skeptical, if you're like Thomas, if you aren't sure if you believe the risen Jesus is real, take a moment to ask Jesus if you can put your fingers into his side, into his hands, Come and see, find the treasure, believe and follow the risen Jesus. He is not a dead God. He is not a God of history. He is a God who is alive and still meets us in the present now, who is still making us new like he himself has been made new and brought back to life again. That's the great hope of Easter. That's what we celebrate today. And know in your ordinariness, this extraordinary is open to you to to follow Jesus. We're going to move into a time of worship. Normally at at a church service uh, uh, this morning, we would do communion, where we would uh, come and reflect on Jesus' body and uh, broken and his blood shed for us. But today we're not going to do that because we are reflecting on the fact that he is alive again. We took communion on Good Friday, on Friday night. Today we are reflecting on the fact that he has been made new again and we have a hope of one day being raised again as well. Let me pray for us and we'll enter into that time. Lord God, we thank you that you are a risen and living God. You are not a God of history. You are not a God uh, contained to a book, Lord, but you are a God who is moving in our midst today and who promises us that we are also living people and will have a hope of living even after we die. God, that you will take our brokenness, you will take these lives that are like broken pottery, and you will restore them. You will make them more beautiful than before, 